Uh, welcome to the online SEM and TEM application for biological sample workshop. We need to inform you that for the participant of this workshop, you'll be get an e-certificate. Jadi Bapak Ibu peserta sekalian nanti akan mendapatkan e-certificate, namun dengan ketentuan mengikuti seluruh kegiatan dan mengisi link presensi yang akan kami bagikan di akhir nantinya. And we have another information, the workshop will be held for maximum of One hour, it is different from our professor's profis schedule because Professor Sikan Karnaki will have another appointment. Jadi nanti kemungkinan akan selesai lebih cepat. Uh, baik, before we start our workshop, allow me to introduce our speaker today. Professor Dr. Matt Sikan Karnati, MSG. For the education, he did a postural study at Justus Leibig University of Giesen. And for the current professional experience, he is as professor in Institute for Anatomy and Cell Biology at Julius Maximilians. He is professor in Institute for Anatomy and Cell Biology at Julius Max, Maximilian's University, Würzburg, and also as senior scientist and imaging specialist at Justus Leibig University of Giessen. And for the research expertise, he is expert in macroscopic and microscopic histology and cytology anatomy. And also he is expert in neuroanatomy and anatomical with clinical relevance. For the current publication in 2022, he has published several papers with the title is Emerging Nanomaterials for Targeting Peroxiso, Second, Regulation of the Homeostatic Unfolded Protein Response in Diabetic Nephropathy. And the third is quantitative lipidomic analysis of Takotsubo syndrome patient serums. So now, Professor Sri Khan Karnati, time is yours. Um, I'm sorry, Professor, you still unmute your microphone. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me all? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah. Yeah, perfect. So first of all, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Uh, and uh, I think we are around 62 participants. And uh, I request, anyway, it is virtual. I cannot see you there, anyone. So I request to on your video if it is possible, so that at least we have a, a similar some interaction with each other and also to see your faces. And then when you go out with the mask, you cannot see the students or audience. So at least now we have the possibility to see all of you. Very good. Thank you very much. Those who are possible to show their video. Yeah, perfect. So um, I think I would like to show my presentation. Um, actually, it's, I have another appointment, so I need to schedule for one hour. Uh, I hope all of you can you able to hear me, right? Yes, we hear you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my main research area is about on the cell organelles. Uh, I work extensively on the mitochondria and uh, peroxisomes. Uh, I used various uh, uh, imaging technologies for all over the 15 years now, uh, trying to understand these organelles. So on this aspect, I was also in uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, <laughs> uh, And that time also I presented this topic and I would like to bring uh, this. I also added some more new imaging techniques, which might be interesting for you. Uh, maybe you cannot able to do it because of the lack of expertise and also very cost effective. Um, okay, then I'll share my screens and then maybe we'll go back through the presentation, right? Yes. Uh, wait, Bill Shumfry Gaben.
something wrong here. Wait a minute, please. Uh, you see my screen now? Not, uh, not yet, Prof. Not yet. Not yet. Yet yeah, now? Okay. Yeah. We see. Yes. Okay. Um, you see the full screen, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, right. Um, I think maybe it is of your interest if you have the possibilities of the, trying to understand about the electron microscopy. Uh, I'll start briefly with the, the uh, history of the microscopy, uh, actually how microscope is evolved, and then some little bit of basics to understand about the light microscopy and then connecting to why we need to go to the uh, transmission electron microscopy and then also other variety of microscopy scanning. I think where you have uh, much expertise and think at that time I came, I also had a nice uh, interaction with the uh, technical uh, persons. I think we also working together with uh, Indonesia, especially uh, for the uh, scanning electron microscopy. Um, and I also show you some of the examples of immuno labeling of my work, my work. And uh, I think this was I would like to uh, something new uh, to introduce you uh, super resolution microscopy, uh, which you is also received the Nobel Prize for this established technique from the Germany and also in America. So um, this was the now first when you see the overview of the discovery. Um, uh, the first started with the Janssen. Um, uh, the Janssen was the first one in the 1590 from the Holland. Uh, he was actually manufactured the first compound microscope. And I think you see the history of the things most of the time were anatomists or medical doctors or the, who led us to discoveries. And I think you know about the Robert Hooke who coined the term cell and then comes uh, Molpigi uh, is also an uh, anatomist and also embryologist. And he first discovered the first capillaries. Um, and then comes the von Leeuwenhoek, he's a father of the microbiology and also nice uh, work led for the discovery of the microscopes from the Netherlands. And there is a little bit of gap for a couple of years and then comes, you know, the uh, Schleider and then Schwann theory. And then comes also the Virko from the Germany. Again, he's the father of the modern pathology and uh, the way in these years, you heard about all the time, leukemia, thrombosis, embolism, and all of these terms will be first coined by the Virko. Uh, and also, he also described the uh, chromatin, no, the first what you call all the term chromatin. Actually, he coined the term uh, chromatin. And also, I think he discovered also uh, many of the relevance of the pathological things. And that's now today's uh, father of the pathology. Uh, when you talk about the microscopy, the most important thing that you think about the principle of the microscope, how it works. And uh, this was first uh, uh, invented by the Ernst Abbe, uh, also which is in the uh, Jena, a place in Germany, where you see uh, because of his uh, discovery from the Jena, a place in Germany, uh, that's called Abbe's lab, it's uh, Ernst Abbe. So when you think about this uh, text, uh, is a little bit complicated because of most of the physics is attached, but uh, uh, any kind of the light that you use as a principle has a particular uh, length, wavelength, and also the resolution of that length of the wavelength is limited or divided by the numerical aperture. And I think uh, this is where I'm going to talk about more in detail uh, about the Ernst Abbe's law and how the research was or the principles of the light was a limited for so many years. Uh, and then all of a sudden with the super resolution technique, you break this law, it's called Ernst Abbe's law. So somebody proposed the, some law, I think a long time ago, and then uh, all the people or researchers or the whole community on the world are trying to follow the law. But somebody came all of a sudden and said, no, we can also break the law and try to divide something. And that is how this super resolution microscopy discovered. 
So uh, this is what you see here is exactly the uh, visible light because we have the light spectrum when you see, uh, it's called the electromagnetic spectrum. I think everybody knows about it, uh, but what we could see uh, because the whole electromagnetic spectrum, we can only see the visible light that is going from the 400 nanometer to 750 nanometer. This is what that we can see. The rest, that we do not see. For example, you use also X-rays, gamma rays, microwave, we're used for microwave rays, or you also use a television rays, or also radio waves. So what we're going to work with now is that this is a visible light. So how we use this visible light, trying to understand properties, and so that we can also see the imaging using this visible light. So uh, again, it's coming to the uh, Abbe's law, but again, uh, we did not go more into the physics. Uh, I would like to briefly explain what does it mean. So it's called a numerical aperture. I think uh, these days, uh, 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 I think everybody has a mobile uh, handy with smartphone, a nice resolution of the, uh, or maybe uh, three cameras or four cameras with a high resolution. And I think it's typically uh, the numerical aperture of any kind of a lens, it's uh, estimates of how much light from the sample is collected by the objective. I think uh, the higher magnification objective have a greater numerical aperture. I think it's a practically, I think you always compare of your handies or mobiles, or how much lens you have, what is the magnification you can have, you know, or how much the megapixel you can take it, right? So um, the higher megapixel you have, it has a higher, greater numerical aperture. So what is it connection? It means that uh, in the end, it is directly connected with the resolution. So maybe you have a very higher magnification of the lens and then higher megapixel of the camera. So it can also zoom in, but still you can able to see clearly the resolution of the image. This is what actually practically that also occurs in the microscopy technique. So it means you have a glass slide here, and then after you have a cover slip, and you put some kind of oil for the refraction. And then the specimen that what you have here, of course, when you, the light passes through and hits the specimen, automatically it reflects the electrons, yeah? So the numerical aperture is exactly the total light that is reflected, uh, is uh, collected by the object too. That is called the Na numerical aperture. So what is the connection of this numerical aperture? Because you know, when you also with an handy, you take an image, the, if it is a, a particular distance, you can able to take a nice, beautiful image. But if you go a little bit longer, you cannot able to take it. And also if you zoom in, you cannot, uh, you cannot able to take a, a very clear image because the resolution will be going away. So this is exactly the same thing, it means the, the amount of the uh, light that is collected uh, is a reflective uh, the numerical aperture. But if you see how it is connecting this to the resolution. So uh, you see, if you have a, a small peak here, a dot here, and you can see a peak, that's the intensity that is giving of this uh, spot. And uh, if you see compared to the C that there are two spots nearby, you can able to clearly see the two individual uh, peaks. And if you are very clearly nearby, and you can see also very clear, the, the uh, uh, basal part is completely connected, but the only apical part, you can see small peaks. So the resolution, it means that uh, it's a limit up to which the two small objectives are still seen very separately. And uh, this is exactly the numerical aperture is connected with the uh, resolution. So it means uh, the higher the, the light that the electrons are emitting that you can able to catch up. And still you see clearly the two independent particles are even though they're very clearly aligned that can be separated. So for example, you can see very here when this numerical aperture is completely closed, yeah, then you see the total image that you collected is a little bit blur because you cannot see very clearly. But if you open the numerical aperture up to 0.79 in the middle, you can see a little bit of clarity that you can also see the intensity. But if you completely open the numerical aperture, there's a maximum 1.3, then you can see clearly the total image and also one particle to the other particle, you can clearly separate. And this is exactly the connection between the numerical aperture to the resolution. Yeah, so the connection is that uh, why we then when, when you when you are using the light as a source 
and trying to detect the any kind of image or particles why we need to have electrons because the light microscopy can only do up to the 100 nanometer maximum up to the one millimeter. It means using the visible light, we can only go between the 400 to 700 or 650 to 700 maximum. So this is a nanometer or within the wavelength that can able to detect. So beyond that, we cannot able to detect the any kind of imaging. So before that, therefore we need to use the electrons that where we can also go up to one angstrom. So it comes to the, again the electromagnetic spectrum that what you see, this is only the light, the visible spectrum where we can see the using the light as a source to image the things. But if you want to go with the electrons, then you can able to go into the very deep detail way where you can able to see up to the one angstrom. So this is a typical image of an electron microscope uh, where you can see clearly there you have a gun which runs with the cathodes and where you put the sample holder, you put your samples here and then pass through the three lenses uh, and then you take a, a image. Uh, so you see this is an electron gun uh, that due, due to the cathode that hits or sends the electrons through the condenser lens and then you have a specimen grid where the specimen is there and that electron is passes to the specimen grid. And then after here, you have a vacuum because then the uh, after the specimens, it goes directly in the vacuum, goes to a screen. I mean, those days uh, when during my uh, doctoral degree, I was developing with the negative, I think you might know, this can negatives in the Photoshop, uh, where you go for develop your photos, they develop with uh, special solutions, the negative to make a photo. But uh, I think uh, since now almost say 10 years, we have uh, CCD cameras. So you don't need to go into the wet labs to develop, rather uh, you can directly that uh, electronic microscopic image can clearly see on the CCD camera. And so you do not have a kind of a negative, but I still feel, you know, those negative things are where you can have a customize, the higher that you keep in the solution developer, you can see sometimes also nice uh, images. Yeah, so what are the possibilities and the advantages and disadvantages of the electron microscopy? Of course, we have a short wavelength of the, so that you get a, a high resolution. Um, it also has a very good interaction with the materials of the contrast, yeah, and it's a uh, highly intensity, easy to produce, but a very laborious work. It takes a lot of time, almost uh, one week or two weeks to know whether this is really working what you want. And there are a lot of protocols you need to go through. And sometimes also it's very laborious, cost effective, and also boring sometimes because you need to have a special interest to come into that. But uh, the whole thing, whatever the cell biology, what we're doing, the ultimate confirmation you get it is only the electron microscopy because you see the real practically how the cell behaves up to the, you know, with that magnification, with that resolution, we can see clearly. So those techniques, what kind of, any kind of technique that you do, they are kind of a physiological or biochemical techniques, but that do not tell you exactly structure of the cell. And this can be only done with electron microscopy. So, um, I mean, there will be always uh, disadvantages, uh, but uh, uh, I would uh, uh, really focus and also, if you want to really to do a science or to understand the things, electron microscopy is the best and right way. So you can compare with the light microscopy to the electron microscopy. So where you can see uh, in the uh, light microscopy use as a light as a visible source between the 760 to 390, that is the maximum where you can see. But electrons you use the monochrome electrons and it goes up to approximately four nanometer. So you can see resolution. <laughs> that is up to 0 0.0 nanometer. This is a very tiny, but you can also see the nuclear pore structure, nuclear membrane structure, and also integrins on the membrane. So all those kind of small structures that what you read in the books that can able to see with the electron microscope. Um, here you use a high voltage, of course, but in the light microscope, you use a halogen lamp and lamp as a source for the electrons uh, light uh, pass through. And the lenses are with the glass, with the light microscope, but the electron, you have magnets because of the vacuum and also thing. Um, and the focusing screen, of course, you can see with the retina and electron microscope also you can see with the retina. I used to work also still with the eye, uh, much better than the screen. Uh, but of course, you can also connect electron microscope with a, a CCD screen. Uh, 
when it comes to the preparation of specimens, uh, you for the light microscope, you can also see under the microscope, either living or the dead tissue, but electron microscope, now the technology is not yet so developed that you can see a live intact tissue under the electron microscope. So it has to be, must be dehydrated. So it is dead. So there are some techniques, it's called a freezing technique where you can keep the cells under the freeze and thaw and check it, but still the structures are actually altered. For the light microscope, you use generally alcohol as a dehydrating agent, but for the electron microscope, because of the content of the lipids, either you need to do osmification with the osmium tetroxide or potassium ferromagnesinate. Uh, this is a KMNO4. Uh, so that these are the things uh, depending upon the uh, purpose why you're doing the electron microscope, the fixation has to be done. Mostly people will do with the glutaldehyde. It's a very good contrast metal and it keeps the structure and contrast of the membranes very well. So you need to optimize the, depending upon the, your purpose, the concentrations of the glutaldehyde. Yeah, uh, you can use the uh, normal embedding for the light microscope, use a wax, but electron microscope, you need to use resin and it has to be uh, properly embedded up to four days in the incubator at 38 degrees. So first 65 degrees for the melting and then fixation comes under 38 degrees. So you can use normal macrotome to make the sections, uh, but here we have a, a different macrotome. Mostly we use diamond to cut the electron microscope uh, objectives or slides, or we use glass to cut it. Um, you can use all kinds of dyes, water soluble dyes for the staining of the light microscopic preparation, but electron microscope use generally heavy metals. Um, and also we use copper grid for the structure of the electron microscopy. Uh, I'll show you some few pictures if you do not have an experience, how the structure looks like. Uh, I would say that it's a very laborious process, but it's a lot of fun and you have to go through a lot of protocols to get into a nice image. And it also takes one to two weeks of the work. Um, this is called the resin, agar resin. And uh, first you keep the resin here and put the specimen in the dome. So this is floating here. And then you fix it into a warm it up to 60 degrees. And then after you prepare a wax. So this is the kind of wax. You can also put a small label here to know what it is inside. And then after you prepare normally the these kind of specimens will be cut with a diamond knife or a glass knife. So these are structures I prepared myself. You take a glass and you cut into a triangle and then you have a knife a knife hand. And there with this, you cut this, uh, we cut this, uh, this specimen here and then you cut into small pieces, yeah? So these are the copper grids and these are the copper grids are very tiny. So generally you don't put this copper grids directly into the electron microscope because you hit with electrodes. So you keep a kind of small coating, this is called foam via coating. So it means that uh, uh, when you put and hit the section. So you, the section comes on the copper grid here, and this is coated, and this goes into the electron beam. And then, because what does it happen is that, you know, when you put the electrons on the section directly, it breaks the section. So not to break the section that our specimen, so we coat a kind of small light coating with a foam wire so that it's a kind of protects the section and also section with the glass slate, what we cut it, it adherence directly to the copper grid. And this copper grid now will go into the specimen here. And then you put the electron gun and then it goes to the object two aperture and gives a vacuum and comes to the screen. So this is a, a transmission electron microscope using the temp column. Uh, so light microscope, very important thing is you get around 400 to 700 nanometer. But uh, electron microscope use electrons as a source, then you have to get up to 0.1 angstrom, so which is very beautiful. So the basic important difference is that light microscope, you use the light as a source, electron microscope, electrons are the source. But what is the difference in the structure? The resolution is a difference. And then transmission electron microscope, the name itself says, the electrons will transmit through the preparation. It means through the cell. 
so that you can see able to the inside of the cell very clearly the ultra structure of the cell can be clearly seen with electron microscopy so all kind of cell organelles cell structure plasma membrane can be clearly seen the status of the electron microscopy it comes the next one there you have a very nice uh, instrument I also worked with this is a scanning electron microscope or raster electron microscopy so the basic difference here is that the scanning electron microscope scans the specimen so specifically we get the surface of the any kind of structure of the scanning electron microscope so this is called a topography and morphology and we can also use the scanning electron microscopy. I think before it was not so usually done, but uh, now recent 10 years, it substantially developed to use the scanning electron microscopy just because that uh, there are various kind of other faculties are much more interested to understand the surface of the topography. So specifically the chemistry, grains, uh, any kind of faculty take, especially also cosmetics. So this a lot of work is going on. Like uh, you apply also epidermis on the how on the skin. Any kind of a treatment that you do, uh, how or maybe infection, how it is penetrating to see the structure. So any kind of cream that you apply on the skin, uh, how deep, how thick, how far, and how the cell structure changing. So everything can be studied in the modern technology using this uh, scanning electron microscopy because you can see the surface very beautiful. And one more important thing in comparison to the transmission electron microscopy is that it's very simple. It's not so much laborious. And it transmits a very tiny and very small and you need to be very accurate and uh, expertise you need to have in order to work with that. But uh, scanning electron microscopy is goes with a very large sample preparations and small structures cannot be seen because it needs to be a little big. So sample preparation is very easy and you need to have big samples in order to work with. And the technique is also is very simple. It's exactly the same that the electrons you use, the electrons will come and hit the sample and the electrons will go out. So when you see, what are different electrons that are coming and hitting the sample and what are emitting? So these are the incoming electrons that hit the sample. And you emit the secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, and also X-rays, and also minutes. So most importantly, you get the secondary electrons and backscattered electrons. This will be catched by a detector. There you can get an image. Yeah, that's how the same principle of the uh, transmission and scanning electron microscopy works. But uh, the important thing for the any kind of microscopic technique is the fixation, right? Fixation means um, it's kind of a statue. So the structure, especially used most of the time, um, paraformaldehyde for the uh, lights, uh, like, like the chemical fixation for the light microscopy. Uh, but if you use for the electron microscopy, as I told you, use GA, glutaldehyde. So what does it will do, this kind of fixation? This fixation is having aldehydes. So our body, all the cell structures composed of the proteins and uh, uh, cellular structures and chemical, uh, 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 and then uh, uh, aldehyde groups. And beside the proteins, these aldehyde groups, uh, the paraformaldehyde or glutaldehyde will go and bind between the aldehyde groups so that it won't move anymore. So it's a kind of a static process. And you try to see exactly how the structure was made, how it was static position was made. So this is a chemical fixation where you also generate artifacts, uh, but uh, we don't have any other solution. The other solution is a physical fixation where you use a freezing. So you take any sample and keep it under minus 160, like a liquid nitrogen. So it will be statue and you try to cut it embed it and use either the cryo ultra microtomy so that uh, you can directly under the cryo sections means you're measuring the minus 20 you try to see the cryo temp so i also worked with the physical fixation also cryo ultra microtomy cryo tm but uh, it needs to be gone through much more laborious much more complicated and very long work 
to get a certain image. And sometimes it's also a lot of artifacts to generate because there is no fixation. The living things are moving and it's only free substitution. So chemical fixation also you generate some artifacts, but at least uh, even it's laborious, uh, it's laborious, but still you can work with. Okay, just I want to post there was somebody put the chat, but it's not for me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's continue with this chemical fixation. So what you do generally with you take any kind of a specimen that you do with uh, uh, glutohaldehyde or paraformaldehyde para fixation, and you put a lot of time trying to understand what is the concentration that you want to fix it because depending upon the concentration, the agent that you use, you have a difficult uh, scenarios. So after the fixation, you use the dehydration of course, you remove the alcohol, uh, and then after remove the water and use with the alcohol, and then you do embedded with the resins, and then you go with the uh, ultra macro time. This is what you see uh, with the diamond knife or the glass knife, and you make the sections and you check under the transmission microscopy. But there is also a way where you can use the same method and you label the uh, using the specific antibodies. And this is called immunolabeling. I also call, I also show some of the images of that. So once you prepare the normal immunolabeling, uh, normal the antibody immunofluorescence that you do on the sections or the cell culture players, similar way you can also do after the uh, fixation, making this copper grip thin uh, slides, semi-thin slides. And then after you do the immuno gold labeling because the gold labeling particles are generally uh, seven to 15 nanometer size. And there with uh, those are coupled with the primary antibody. And then you do the immuno labeling and check under the immuno microscopy. Then you can clearly see those gold particles where which are labeled to the specific antigen that can be clearly visualized the immuno TM. So I would like to show you also some uh, specific examples that how did the workflow there. And then comes to the next part of this uh, transmission electron microscopy of the mouse, lung and liver, show you some of the nice images. And uh, my research interest is more mostly on the paroxysms. These are very tiny organelles, which are completely ignored in the field of cell biology. And I started my work with the, the uh, paroxysms trying to understand similar like the mitochondria. You see in every cell, almost in all the cells in our body, you have the paroxysms. And I think uh, uh, only there are a few cells that you do not find. Those are the erythrocytes and also uh, sperms. Uh, and erythrocytes are the only cells in our whole body which do not have the paroxysms. So they almost almost similar to the mitochondrial functions. They share a lot of homology with mitochondria, but we do not know anything about the functions or why we are there in the whole body. So I started my uh, doctoral thesis with the lung and uh, I'm still working with these organelles since 15 years and nobody else in the world is working with paroxysms in the lung. <laughs> So you see, this is a typical uh, transmission electron microscopy of a, a club cell. Uh, we are talking about in the um, ter terminal bronchioles, where you can clearly see uh, the mitochondria. Generally, you expect a mitochondria to have a cristae, but in the club cells, you have a completely different mitochondrial structure. And you can see very nicely seen the granules of the uh, non ciliated cell, uh, these are the club cells. And we compare to the ciliated cells, you can see a clear paroxysmal structure. They are labeled with uh, paroxysmal reaction, DAB, and we see different size in the relation uh, to the different cells in the paroxysms. And you can clearly see the mitochondria of a allular epithelial type to cell, a secrecy of the mitochondria clearly seen in, and also very two paroxysms around and also along with paroxysms. So uh, to, uh, for the, my doctor orbit took almost six years. And after six years, I got these beautiful images. And these are the first images in the science, uh, old biology. Yeah, um, you can see very clearly also the alveolar type 2 cell very beautifully, and you can see the nice structure mitochondria, and they're characterized with the lamellary bodies. Those are the lipids that you need to label them properly, fix them properly in order to see uh, these lipids. And my first, uh, first work, first two years were very difficult to find it because you cannot be able to find um, the lamellar lipids, they all dissolve. So you need to find change the methods in order to be able to see those things. And you can see the different size relation of the paroxysms in different epithelial cells of the uh, 
of the alveolar epithelium. And these are the basal membrane, and this is the endothelial cell, and this is a type 1 cell where you have the gas exchange takes place, the typical place there you can also see a clear type 1 cell. Yeah, and also see very elongated uh, paroxysms. It's a typical structure of paroxysm having a head and also a long tail. And depending upon where you see, sometimes if you cut through the image here, then you get a round paroxysm. And this is a, a cross section. Then you can see the uh, uh, round paroxysms. Otherwise, generally in a typical status in the uh, long form, you can see very elongated paroxysms and very beautiful mitochondria and this uh, onion rings these are the lamellar bodies where actually the surfactant is prepared and then stored. And these are the macrophages. Uh, typically, these are the characteristic features of macrophages are having the lysosomes. And this is what you can see very clearly. That's what you can also in the electron microscope, you can identify a beautiful lysosomes, uh, very big lysosomes. And you can also see a typical uh, paroxysms in the very near vicinity to the lysosomes. Yeah, um, this is one of the uh, my student uh, working together uh, to understand about the one of the gene of the paroxysms and where you can clearly see uh, how the structures are clearly changing. Maybe some of you can able to see or guess what are these black structures that you see. Anyone can tell, just kind of have no idea. Anyone has an idea? What are these black structures? What it could be? It could be anything, yeah? You can just feel it to talk. I can tell you a small hint. Um, these are the just newborn animals. Just as soon as they're born, our litters, we fix them, we embed them, and we cut them for the lung. Lungs are embedded and cut for the pieces. And we are looking at a one, alveolar epithelial cell between a wild type and a knockout cell. And there you can see a significant differences. And in the both cells, you see typical deposition of the black part. And these are the newly born litters. What kind of structures it could be? So you can see very clearly the lamellar bodies in the type 2 cell and also a typical microvilli, microvilli and erythrocyte blood, also another cell with the basal membrane here. I can see very clearly the nucleus of each cell. And then you'll see the block depositions. So any guesses? Somebody is speaking. The hint is that these are the newborn animals. As you know, the uh, mouse, as soon as they brought up no, into the come to the world, they don't have the eyes. They need to suck the food from the mother. Now after three to four days, then they start to develop the eyes. They start to open. Somebody's talking. <laughs> Okay, so if you don't have the food, what happens? If you don't eat for you know, a half day or one day, what happens to you? So what happens to you that you feel weak and then body converts the glycogen to the glucosin, right? So gluconeogenesis. So it's called, you generate the glucose from the glycogen. So glycogen is the reserve food that you have all the time in our body. Similarly, as soon as the mouse uh, gives a birth, all the babies, you know, all the ones, it's a nature that how it's actually incorporated into our body with the knowing ourselves. It means even the mother in some, any kind of circumstances, the mother is not able to provide the milk or the babies, some problems could not able to get the food. But the nature in a way that uh, in the body, in all the cells, there's a huge deposition of the glycogen. And this is what that you see in the, as soon as you take in the 
you i'm talking about one cell you have so much of the uh, deposition of the glycogen like that you have billions of cells and billions of millions of tissues everywhere you see typical deposition of the glycogen these are the food reserves so that the baby in circumstances when you do not have the food you can cope the energy you can get the energy by conversion of this glycogen to glucose okay that's the reason you see the things but what you can clearly see in this transmission electron matters images is that you can clearly see there is a deep microbiome or completely gone and there is absence of this lamellar bodies so these structures that you can only see under the microscope or microscope you cannot see you need to have the transmission electron microscope in order to see the fine structures of an any kind of cell that is only possible with them yeah and this is about the immuno labeling that i was talking before um, where you generally do the labeling of the antibodies with the, the confocal microscopy or immunofluorescence similar way you can also do the labeling at the electron microscopic level it's called post embedding immunocytochemistry so the typical marker for the proxomes is a catalyst what you can see is that mitochondria very beautiful and you can see a nice proximal membrane 1 2 3 and they are clearly labeled with catalyst gold particles and these are the 50 nanometer gold particles that are coated with the catalyst antibody and there you can clearly see see it's also very elongated peroxisome here and the mitochondria are completely negative and that shows this also another peroxisome very clear one and specifically labeled with uh, this catalyst particles and this way how you can clearly say a specific antibody labeling at the immuno electron microscopic level so why a term called as seeing is believing because uh, it's a general uh, liver and lung normal tissues that it labeled with the two proteins one is a mitochondrial protein and one is a proximal protein and generally mitochondria and proxomes they almost you can say lie in the vicinity together and when you see in the some of the regions you can see a yellow you see the yellow here and you see yellow here and all the time you see the green and red are separate most of the time green and red are separate but sometimes green and red are very together yeah so you think that uh, many people believe that uh, when the people when the two proteins red and green they overlay on each other you get the yellow labeling and the same people believe that uh, yes these two proteins are actually labeled with the uh, mitochondrial protein labeled peroxomes or peroxome proteins on the mitochondria so and the people believed for so many years that uh, uh, superoxide dispotase 2 is also a peroxomal protein and uh, when you see the labeling you see most of the time it is not labeled but in some regions it is actually co labeled and they believe that uh, superoxide dispotase 2 is actually labeled the peroxomes so it is a peroxomal protein but when i started labeling the things uh, the problem i did not see all the time so i was very sure to make sure that whether it is really a proximal protein or mitochondrial protein so what i did i went on to check under the electron microscopy and also immuno electron microscopy to make sure that whether this protein is only on mitochondria or it is also on the peroxomes so i used the liver and then you see the catalase and you can see very nice mitochondria of the liver and a very beautiful labeling of the peroxomes and the typical specific labeling for the catalase and when you see also in the different regions all the peroxomes are clearly labeled with the catalase but mitochondria are completely empty so you see also how near they are you see they are very very close nearby and when you see with the superoxide dismutase too the sod2 immuno labeling you can see those clearly mitochondria are very labeled but the peroxomes are negative 1 2 3 4 mitochondria all four mitochondria are specifically labeled with super dismutase 2 but one two peroxomes in the very center they are completely negative and this is a negative control 
So what does it tell you with this confocal microscopy? Because um, this is also again the same example with the other regions. So confocal microscopy has a kind of a limitation between up to less than 200 nanometer, you cannot able to resolve the things. So what we see here, these confocal microscopic images, you see most of the time they are resolved, but those regions, when they're very nearby, less than 200 nanometer, you cannot resolve these two individual particles as separate. But with the electron microscopy, you can clearly see they are less than 100 nanometers, but you can still separate the clear labeling of the peroxomes to the mitochondria. This is what it means that seeing what you see at the confocal level, you may not need to believe it because what actually happens at the ultra structure level is quite different. This is what that you see here. And then after we published in the uh, history of chemistry cell biology, saying that uh, uh, people were believing for so many years that a superoxide dismutase 2 is actually a mitochondrial protein and it's not a proximal protein. So this is a study that shows that uh, people should not think or cite that uh, SOD2 is not a proximal protein. Yeah, I will show you some images of the uh, scanning electron microscopic of the mouse lung stages. Uh, you see very nice here. This is a, a, a terminal bronchioles. The very exactly the conductive part of the uh, 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 air that goes into the lungs will be stopped here. Uh, and see a nice uh, surface of the luminal surface. So here is a lumen. And it's a kind of a we cut a cut through the complete uh, terminal branchials, and then we can see the surface of the uh, mouse uh, newborn lung, and we can clearly see all those are cells, beautiful cells, uh, sort of into the lumen, and there are also nice cilia that are expressing. And when you go into the more, and it's a typical lung lobe, it completely cut through the half, and you see some of the all of the alveoli here. And this is a region that I high magnified. So lumen is open here. And the luminal epithelial cells that are higher magnified here, where you can clearly see a beautiful, nice club cells. And then between the ciliate cells, and this is only possible with the scanning electron microscopy. It's very clear. And when you see in higher magnification, you can see also some of the debris, or some of the erythrocytes and also nice cilia that are going through. So um, this is another image area where you want to focus and see how dif different they are. So the question is now, you also see a nice cilia, ciliated cells, and these are all the club cells. But when I go, what are these structures here? In higher magnification, you see there are many here. This is a nice cilia, like a brush, na? and these are the club cells. It's an erythrocyte here. And what are these structures? An idea. So uh, all the ciliated cells or epithelial cells, they not live for longer, right? All epithelial will generate, proliferate, they die, and new cells will come. So these are the comes the progenitors. So it means uh, they are again the ciliated cells. Once they will be died or this life is gone, they will become the uh, matured ones. So they are in the right now, they are in the growing phase of the ciliated cells. Okay, this answer. And for us also, it took some time to understand these structures. And also important thing is just not about the doing the structures, but it's very important that how you interpret interpretation. This interpretation comes with experience and also understanding about the histology. Yeah, and this is also this uh, post embedding immuno electron microscopy where you can clearly see another protein called a CC10. The CC10 protein specifically strains the club cell secretory granules where you can clearly see these are all the secretory granules and they are nicely labeled with the CC10 protein and the rest of the regions, they are negative. So saying that this is a, a specific antibiotic labeling on the secretory granules, where you can clearly see the specificity of the antibody and also the scientific work. You can see this is a nice uh, secretary. This is a lumen of the cell 
uh, of the tissue, bronchial terminalis, and then you can clearly see the uh, a cell junction to another junction, one cell and this is another cell, and a lot of mitochondria clearly seen here, and also inside the mitochondria here, but only on this complete section, you can clearly see the labeling of the uh, typical secretic granules, and that shows also again the specificity of the protein. Good, now it's coming to the uh, last part, that is a super resolution microscopy. And actually why it has got given into the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in the 2014. So the key is that people are believing that uh, light has a source where you can use up to the uh, 350 to uh, 700 nanometer as a visible light. And that can be done with light microscopy or the confocal microscopy. And for that, uh, to see the more in detail about the structures, you need to use the electron microscopy. But the rule has been broken uh, by the Stefan Hell and other colleagues from the Göttingen in Germany. And they said that, no, we can break the ends of Islam and we can still use the same light as a source. And we can still be able to see below 200 nanometer size particles. And that is the way exactly the super resolution microscopy came. So this is one part of the called uh, same structured illumination microscopy. And this is called, uh, uh, which, which of course, actually, if it generates a kind of a pattern, what is called pattern one, and then generates another pattern pattern two. And if you combine these two patterns, then you call a fringes moira pattern. And that's how they will be able to develop this kind of difficult structures or more in clear. So I use some kind of cell culture, C22 and T7 cells, just regular labeling for the normal typical labeling anyway time you do in the fluorescence. And you go with a, a special microscope called lra CMAC from the size, and then you have a black software you need to develop some kind of segmentation protocols. What happens principally is that you see there is a point here and this pattern of a projection is moving around. And by that, you can develop, able to develop a clear picture image about this spot. Yeah, this has to, these are three rotations and five phase shifts so that you can able to check is exactly the typical pattern of the image. So this is what we use with the cell culture plate and immunomicroscopy. You can say typical structure of the paroxysms that you see very beautiful with the typical labeling on the membrane of the paroxysm specs 14. So there is a typical structure where you can able to analyze. It's called a full width half maximum, uh, where you can able to see how much nanometer that can be able to get it. So we got it up to the 177 nanometer. So which is actually super resolution because uh, you break the law uh, because the law is comes from the abyss law from 300 nanometer to 700 nanometer. So we come up to the resolution where you can clearly see the two particles up to the 177 nanometer. But the, my aim is not fulfilled because I want to really see this port protein structure on the peroxisome of the on the uh, super resolution level. So I don't uh, really much uh, happy about this technique. So I went to the uh, STAT microscopy. It is called a stimulated emission depletion microscopy. And this STAT technique principle, it works exactly like a confocal microscopy. So this confocal microscopy is basing on the a point. It's a called single point laser scanning microscopy so that you can achieve higher magnification. So uh, what happens in the confocal microscopy is that simply you have a laser is focused on a particular spot. And the spot scans the specimen in a raster pattern, same specimen. So the fluorophores at that spot illuminated by the laser and that are excited. So in the confocal microscopy, you have a pinhole. I think you all of you know, and this pinhole is a conjugate to the focus spot and eliminates all the focus that is out of the focus to the detector. It means in the end, you have a spot here and spot around the eliminated fluorophores will be actually detected to the detector. And there you get the confocal microscopy. So the difference to the STAT microscopy is that is exactly the same. You have a spot, the laser is excited on the spot, and then you have a excitation of the fluorophores. But what happens in the stimulated emission depletion microscopy, as soon as the spot gives the fluorophores and the surrounding the electrons will be depleted. So it means only on the spot water the fluorophores are there, it will be detected to the detector so that you get a very fine resolution of the spot, means objective. So you can see an example here, it's a normal cell with a cell nucleus. 
it's a typical pattern of the PEX14 labeling. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to focus on this uh, region of interest, which is magnified here. And then this is a typical image region of interest of the confocal. And then we used a deconvolution software to remove the background to see the structures more better. The same image after the deconvolution, you can see very clear a nice image. And then same region is again subject to the stack microscopy on the same, same machine. Then you can clearly see the background is completely removed. And then stat microscopy is again uh, deconvolution. Then you can clearly see a confocal microscope after the deconvolution. And then stat microscope after deconvolution. You can see the how much background is been removed and we can able to get a, a nice resolution. When going through all those kind of uh, tons of data, then you can able to see a nice typical proxim structure, what you have seen in the electron microscope, a kind of a having a head and a long tail that can be also very clearly seen here. See the distribution of the PEX14 on the membrane of the protein. You can see a nice head here and also a tail and the distribution of proteins on the membrane. This was actually my aim. And there come to a conclusion that you have a size of a 150 nanometers of the proxim head and a tail of up to 505 micrometer, which is still now not shown in the literature. And you can able to see the distinct between the gap of one protein to the other protein is around 60 nanometer. So this was actually the, uh, you know, the first using the light as a source to come into the cell biology and trying to understand a typical structures on the membrane of the protein is possible is only through the super resolution microscopy. I think that's all from me. I think yeah. I'm very open to the questions. And if you have any yeah. questions, please feel to ask. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Professor Srikan Karnati. Now we come to the question and answer session. For all participants, you can write the question at the chat box or can be delivered directly by activating the microphone. Jadi Bapak Ibu sekalian, jika ada pertanyaan bisa langsung unmute mikrofonnya atau bisa dituliskan juga melalui chat box. Okay, we have one question from Puspa. Uh, this, the question is, this may sound like technical question, but when I work with biomaterial samples and cell culture, sometimes I use SAM to observe the interaction between materials and the cells. So I can get the morphological information of the cells when they are attached to the object. Uh, previous, previously, I used glutaraldehyde 2.5% and serial concentration of ethanol to fix it the cell and materials. The challenge is how can I make sure or check that the cell aren't was away and perfectly fix it to the materials. Do I need another method to confirm this fixation? Uh, I can tell you maybe briefly, I think you're talking about the cell culture materials, right? So when you use for the SEM, uh, you need to make a big pellet. First thing, so you need to centrifuge to wash the medium. And I think you need to have a lot of cells in order to go for a uh, SEM through the cell culture. Okay. Um, I don't know how many cells you use for the SEM. Uh, generally, if you use less cells and they're not adherent, it will be away. And you need to use a lot of samples, a lot of cells to aggregate them, wash them, and make a big aggregate kind of pellet that you can see. If you cannot see the pellet, I think it's quite difficult to see the same images, but these things that you can also use for the temp, yeah? Temp, it doesn't need more material, but also you need to see the pellet. So uh, how many cells you used? Did you able to see the pellet? Actually, uh, use this method to know the interaction between biomaterials. It is a solid material. So I put the materials inside 
to the well, to the well plate. Usually I use 24 well plate. Mm -hmm. And then I see the cell uh, in the up of the materials. And then yeah. I, yeah. So I, if we want to observe the interaction between the materials and the cells, so I cannot use the light microscope or inverted microscope because the materials is solid materials. So I need mm. to use the SAM. And mm. then I fix the sample using glutaraldehyde and mm. the hydrate using serious ethanol. Mm. And, and then I try the samples in the incubator overnight. Mm. And uh, the next day I will uh, coat the cells in the same uh, for the same preparation. So I never uh, pellet the cells uh, to the next preparation for the same because I want to see the how the cells interact with the materials, how the cells attach to the materials. Okay, I got your point. Uh, maybe can you use the agar as embedding medium to fix the cells so that they won't move. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe try to check in the literature uh, because uh, generally um, coating needs to be done. Some cells has to be embedded, right? Because you want to see yes. the interaction of the materials with your cells, right? Yeah. And when you fix them, the fixation 2.5 is only gives a contrast, but not it will wash away, right? This is the main problem you have. Yeah. Maybe you try to check, try to fix those in a agar or any kind of embedding medium so that they are temporarily fixed there and they're not washed away. So oh, okay. this fixation, we do it regularly with the temp. We do. I mean, we can also do fix with glutaldehyde. At the same time, also we can fix with the agar so that the samples will not move away. Okay. Okay. So I need to, I need to add osmium tetraoxide to uh, make the fixation more to make the no. fixation better or no uh, awesome is it enough said, to use yeah. is it enough to use okay. glutaldehyde is enough but if you want to look for some kind of special lipid materials yeah if the cells okay. contain then you need to use the osmium tetroxide for okay. example you know uh, um, goblet cells you have a lipid yeah or okay. some uh, some cells you have a special mm -hmm. lipid content inside then you want to use a uh, Osmium and tetroxide. Otherwise, you don't need. Okay. Thank you very much for your explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. And there is a second question. Yeah, we have another question from Ariel from National Research and Innovation Agency. Uh, he has three questions, Prof. The first question is: You said earlier that the sample is embedded with resin. How do you make sure what EM observed is the specimen and not the resin? Yeah. And so it's how a very to clean question. the resin? Yeah, it's a very good question, practically. Uh, same thing also when you do a normal uh, paraffin embedded tissue, right? And uh, the tissue is there and paraffin is there. And when you cut the tissue and you check under the light microscope, you can see the border with the paraffin. And in the middle, you see the typical tissue without any kind of labeling, even not even H and E regular labeling. You can check under the microscope. There is a typical light diffraction between the paraffin and the tissue. Even though it looks everything light, uh, very uh, bright color, but you can see the difference if you keep it up the way. In similar way, also if you keep the resin with the tissue, and uh, normally when you put the this is a coating that I told you, right? Foam wire coating, yeah, on the copper grade. If you put the electron beam without the coating, the all resin will be spoiled. It's completely gone. There's no resin anymore. And on the resin, you have the, or in the resin, it is embedded in the tissue. And tissue also breaks when you put the electronic beam. Yeah, so you have a nice coating. Resin is on the top. And between the middle, you have a tissue. And you put under the microscope, you can clearly see. So going through this 2.5% fixation of the glutaldehyde, Generally, you have cell membranes are rich of the lipids and they're very contrast. You can clearly see without any kind of labeling, only with fixation on the upon sections that we do regularly, we can clearly see resin is different and the structures are different. Okay, 
I hope this answers your question. And it comes to second question. Can further testing using same EDs? What is ED? Uh, maybe EDX, EDX, bro. EDX. Can further testing using some EDs can be used to see the components of the elements that make up samples from bacteria, cells, or tissues? Oh, it's difficult. We cannot say what are the structures as long as we do not have the complete portfolio. So again, this comes to the question in terms of the interpretation. So um, first thing is in the SAM, you're checking only for the surface and uh, all the time we prepare the kind of a semi thin sections, whatever we are doing for the TEM or the SAM regularly, because uh, when you want to really point out in the electron microscopy or SAM, it's quite difficult where we are and what we are looking at. So there is a middle part from the SEM or TEM to the normal light microscopy is a semi thin section. So semi thin section generally order 70 to 120 nanometer. Is between normal fact, normal light microscopy tissue, we have a fact micrometer. You can cut up to three micrometer. But uh, when you go into the ultra microscopy, you have around uh, 70 nanometer. Between these two, we have a, a different tissue, semi thin section. Also, we cut with uh, glass diamonds and they are 70 to 120 nanometers. So we use 70 to 120 nanometers as a kind of a orientation to see under the electron microscope where we are. Okay. So we always make this uh, semi thin sections. We print it, we take with us into the TEM or SAM and clearly see which reason where we are. Otherwise, no, when you have a big tissue, you make it into small pieces and the small piece are of 80 nanometer, you look under the microscope, you do not have a typical orientation. So the second question, I cannot clearly answer what kind of the elements they are. If you make a semi thin section up to 120 nanometer or 150 nanometer, you are able to clearly see what kind of component it could be. Okay. And the third question. Yeah, the same image I was shown in the 15 kilowatt while to my experience in the 5 kilowatt, right? Gold coating for 20 seconds, it still creates a charging image and damage sample. How do I solve the issue? Yeah, it's also a very practical problem. Um, in the term we use the coating, but SEM, we do not have any kind of coating. Of course, if you use a high kilowatt, the sample will break. Either it could be that a uh, sample is very thin. Either sample is thin. If the sample is thin, generally it breaks the electrons. Electrons break. I think I told you already before also. Um, so what, what you could do is maybe reduce even the energy. I think you reduced five kilowatt with the 20 milliampere gold coating. So even reduce the kilowatt energy. I hope still the electrons are there to sufficient to backscatter one thing or increase the gold coating. For 20 seconds, you only did, yeah. So three possibilities, either you increase the sample thickness so that the, it will not damage. Second, I think you reduce drastically from 15 to five. Still, you can try to reduce the five you know, when the samples are not properly prepared, the problem will persist, even if you change the energy. If you change the energy, I think you cannot penetrate the electrons and you can get the proper image. I think you increase the sample thickness where I think I would focus. I hope I answered your questions, which might help you. All right, maybe it is the end. Uh, no one want to ask the question? Maybe we can close our workshop, Professor. Perfect. So all of you, thank you very much for listening and also uh, all the best. And if you have any kind of uh, uh, questions, uh, you can uh, contact me per email or through Dr. Heavy.
Oke, okay. uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Srikan Kanati, for giving us the knowledge. Hopefully, the workshop will be beneficial for all of us. Now we are reached the end of the workshop. I'm Delar Stefani, on behalf of the us and the committee, we would like to extend our appreciation to you all for your participation. That's all from us. Once again, thank you and good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.